بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Continuing with the book of zakah from the book Amdu al Fiqh of Imam Ibn Qudama al Maqdisi رحمه الله تعالى. We've reached today where we should be taking Bab Zakat al Fitr, the chapter of Zakat al Fitr. This is something we're accustomed to because every Eid al Fitr we know about it. Why is it called Zakat? Why is Zakat al Fitr given the name Zakat? Because we don't really consider it to be from the aspect of Zakat where we pay money. Because in fact, as we will come to know, zakat al-fitr is not to be paid in money. Why is it then termed as zakat? Because what is the meaning of zakat that you took probably with uh, Sheikh Abu Hanifa when he did the early sessions with you on this chapter? One of the meanings of zakat, purification. And another meaning is growth, right? So when you give zakat al-fitr, you are purifying yourself and you are purifying the fasting that you did from any mistakes. So it's to cover any mistakes that you did in the fasting in the month of Ramadan. And also you are purifying yourself in the sense that by giving away from your wealth to the poor in Zakat al-Fitr, your character is improving. And it comes with the other meaning of Zakat, which is growth and namu, to grow. That your character is growing in goodness. Your bank of hasanat, your bank of good deeds are growing in goodness. And the word Fitr itself means the breaking of the fast, okay? So Zakat al-Fitr has these meanings. It's also known as Sadaqatul Fitr. The Imam, he says, وَهِيَ wajiba, wajibatun ala kulli Muslim. What is the word wajib? It is wajib upon every Muslim. It's mandatory, right? It's something that if you do it, you are rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you leave it, you are likely to be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So it's something which is an obligation upon us. And in Bukhari, uh, Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu, he said, فَرَضَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ زَكَاةَ الْفِطْرِ صَعًا مِنَ الْتَمْرِ أو صَعًا مِنَ الْشَعِيرِ أَلَى الْعَبْدِ وَالْحُرِّ وَالذَّكِرِ وَالْأُنْثَرِ وَالصَّغِيرِ وَالْكَبِيرِ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَأَمْرَ أَنْ تُؤَدَّ قَبْلَ خُرُوجِ النَّاسِ إِلَى الصَّلَاةِ Ibn Umar radiyallahu anhu, as in Bukhari, he said that the Prophet sallallahu made it obligatory, zakat al-fitr, that you give a sa'a. What is a sa'a? The size of a sa'a? Four muds. What is a mud? Good. Two handfuls of a normal person. So four, four times this, right? And the weight of it can be said roughly between two and two and a half kilos of normal staple food. So anyway, the Prophet ﷺ in this hadith in Bukhari, narrated by Ibn Umar, made zakat al-fitr obligatory, okay, to be a sa of dates or a sa of barley. On every Muslim, whether that person be uh, a free Muslim, whether the person be a slave, whether it be a female or a male, whether it be small or whether the person is uh, elderly, big, whether young or elderly, okay, from the Muslims. And the Prophet ﷺ ordered that it should be given out before the people go to Salah on Eid al-Fitr, okay? This is what the Prophet ﷺ commanded. So it's something which is obligatory. It's also recommended, as narrated in the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba, that Uthman radiallahu anhu, he used to pay the zakat al-Fitr for the fetus as well, for the unborn child, okay? So if a, if a, a woman is pregnant, and it's past the stage where the ruh, the soul has been breathed into it. Okay, how many days is that? Is that 120? 120 days, right? 120 days. Then the person gives zakat al-fitr also. It's recommended, not obligatory, recommended, based upon the action of Uthman radiallahu anhu, that the person gives zakat al-fitr on this fetus. طيب. Uh, the imam, he says, Malaka fadlan al qutihi wa quta iyalihi laylat al-eid wa yawmahu sa'an. That the zakat al-fitr is obligatory on the person who has more than his needs, okay, for the night of Eid and its day. So the night before Eid and the day of Eid, right? If you have a sa' or more of food, extra food for yourself and then for the members of your family, then it's obligatory upon you to pay zakat al-fitr. طيب, if a person doesn't have food, he doesn't have that sa' of extra food, but he has some wealth lying around. Meaning to say, for example, he has some valuable books lying around that he doesn't need. He has extra copies. These are extra copies and they're valuable. 
he should then go ahead and sell these books and buy the sa of the food that is required to give in zakat al-fitr okay because the person still though he doesn't have the food available he has the wealth lying around and above and beyond his needs that he can use to buy the food that is required to distribute in zakat al-fitr this is what the imam is saying waqad al-fitr sa'un sa'un min al-bur he's saying the estimation of the fitr that you need to be to give is a saw of bur of wheat okay a saw of bur aw sha'ir or of bali aw daqiqihima or of the flower of the two wheat and bali or sawaiqihima aw min al tamar aw al zabib or you can give from the uh, the ground up crushed up bali and wheat or you can give uh, a saw of dates or you can give a saw of raisins this is what is, was, uh, used to be given in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. But what if you're in a situation now where the people generally don't eat these foods? What do you do in that situation? The people of that country, they generally don't eat that food. Huh? Yes, then you give the saw of a local food product, which is the staple diet of the people of that country or the people of that place. Tayyip? فَإِن لَمْ يَجِدْهُ أَخْرَجَ مِنْ قُوتِهِ أَيَّ شَيْءٍ كَانْ صَاعًا and this is what the Imam alludes to a bit further. He said, if you cannot find these items that we mentioned from the wheat and the barley and the dates and the tamar, okay, or the flour of the wheat and the barley, etc., then you give from any food product that you can find to give. Tayyib. So the majority of the ulama, they hold that the zakat, al-fitr, has to be given in food produce, in the food items mentioned, okay, or any other staple foods that people eat. Abu Hanifa rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, money can be given in its place. Opposite to what the majority are saying. Why did he say that? He said, because at that particular time on the day of Eid, it could be that the poor has some food and he doesn't need food on that day. What he requires is to go out and buy some clothes so he can enjoy the day of Eid. Okay? But the majority opinion, as we said, is that only food can be given. The Imam he says, وَمَنْ لَزِمَتْهُ the Imam is saying here that if a person is responsible, he has above and beyond his own needs in terms of food, right? For the night of Eid and the day of Eid. Then whoever he is responsible for in the household, then he has to pay zakat al-fitr for that person also, okay? Responsible means in the sense that you provide their basic needs. So some of the ulama, though it's a minority opinion, they said if someone comes and stays with you for Ramadan, and he stays with you for a month, and you've been feeding this person for a month, now even upon this guest, you have to give zakat al-fitr. Okay? It's quite an interesting statement out of the karam and generosity that the Muslims have. Most of us won't do that, right? We feed for a day and say, you better find a hotel down the road. But if he's with you for a month or so, this is what some of the ulama they said. In any case, anyone that is under your responsibility, then you should be feeding them. What is the evidence for this? That anybody that you are responsible for, you should feed on their behalf. Look back to the hadith that we just spoke about, which mentioned the oblig the. Uh, obligatory nature of the zakat al-fitr in it the prophet sallallahu said that the zakat al-fitr is obligatory even upon the slave does the slave own anything every wealth the slave owns belongs to the master so how can it be obligatory upon the slave what it means is that it's obligatory upon the master who's responsible for the slave to pay for the slave likewise everybody else who is responsible for somebody under his care whoever that be Right? Then the person has to pay zakat or fitr for them. فَإِن كَانَتْ مُؤْنَتُهُ تَلْزَمُ جَمَعَةً كَالْعَبْدُ مُشْتَرَكٍ So if this responsibility is shared by a group of people, like the abd al-mushtarak. The abd al-mushtarak, if somebody had a slave which is owned uh, between a group of people or more than one person. So depending upon how much you own from that slave, your share is the share you will pay of zakat or fitr. وَالْمُعْسَرَ الْقَرِيبِ لِجَمَعَةً and also, if you have, for example, relatives, that it's a shared responsibility between you and some of your other relatives to pay for the poor relatives, that you generally take care of their basic needs. So based upon the share that you have in taking care of their basic needs is what you pay, zakat al-fitr. فَفِطْرَتُهُ عَلَيْهِمْ عَلَى حَسْبِ مُؤْنَتِهِ As I explained. فَإِنْ كَانَ بَعْضُهُ حُرْ 
فَفِطْرَتُهُ عَلَيْهِ وَعَلَى سَيِّدِهِ The Imam, he says, if some of the person that you are paying zakat al-fitr, or if some, if there's a situation where a person, part of him is free, and part of him is not. This is known as Abd al-Mushtarak. لا, not Abd al-Mushtarak, this is known as uh, al-Mukatib. Al-Mukatib is the slave that has agreed with his master that he wants to uh, ransom himself. He wants to purchase himself from his master. He's allowed to do that in Islam. He agrees with his master. And of course, it's encouraged, okay, that the slaves are freed as much as possible. So, this person agrees with his master that I'm going to free myself for 5,000 riyals. He's paid 2,500 riyals, so that means he's half free. So, so the zakat al-fitr, for himself he has to pay half, the other half for himself, the master has to pay. This is what the Imam is saying. وَيُسْتَحَبُّ إِخْرَاجُ الْفِطْرِ يَوْمَ الْعِيدِ قَبْلَ صَلَاةِ الْعِيدِ And it's recommended to give, to give the zakat al-fitr, what did the Imam say? On the day of Eid, before the Salat al-Eid. Now be careful in the wording of the Imam. He's saying to give the zakat al-fitr, to physically give it. It doesn't mean that you go to the masjid before the salah and you give your money, zakat al-fitr, and now you expect them to purchase the food stuff and to distribute it to those who need it. That's, that's wrong. What's going to end up happening is your zakat al-fitr will get to the needy two to three days after you have given the money. So you have to understand what the imam is saying. He said it's recommended to give the zakat al-fitr before the Eid prayer. Okay? Before the Eid prayer. وَلَا يَجُوزْ تَأْخِيرُهَا عَنْ يَوْمِ الْإِيدِ And it's not allowed, not allowed, forbidden, to make ta'khir, to delay the zakat al-fitr beyond the day of Eid. Um, Abi Dawood radiallahu anhu narrates from Ibn Abbas and Athar, a narration of Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, the great scholar of the companions. He said, um, مَنْ أَدَّى zakat al-fitr قَبْلَ صَلَاةَ الْإِيدِ فَهِيَ زَكَاتٌ مَقْبُولًا وَمَنْ أَدَّهَا بَعْدَ صَلَاةَ الْعِيدِ فَهِيَ صَدَقَةٌ مِنَ الصَّدَقَاتِ That whoever gives the zakat al-fitr before the prayer, then it's an accepted zakat. And whoever gives it after the prayer, then it's just a sadaqah. It's a normal charity. I mean, it doesn't suffice of the zakat al-fitr. طيب. وَيَجُوزْ تَقْدِيمُهَا عَلَيْهِ بِيَوْمَيْنِ أَوْ ثَلَاثِ It's allowed for you to give the zakat al-fitr to those who need it uh, a day or two or three before the day of Eid. Okay? بِيَوْمَيْنِ أَوْ ثَلَاثِ Two days or three days before the day of Eid. وَيَجُوزْ أَنْ يُعْطَى الْوَاحِدْ مَا يَلْزَمُ جَمَعًا And it's permissible for you to give one person what should have been given to more than one person from the zakat al-fitr. So if you want to give, like, uh, if you have, you've collected zakat al-fitr, uh, which would have been spread over five people, it's permissible for you to give all of that to one person. طيب. وَيَجُوزَ أَنْ يُعْطَى الْوَاحِدْ مَا يَلْزِمُ الْجَمَعَةِ وَالْجَمَعَةِ مَا يَلْزِمُ الْوَاحِدْ And also, it's permissible for you to give that which you are going to give to one person, distribute it amongst a group of people. The opposite scenario. But of course, in this scenario, you have to be sensible. I mean, you have to really look, how much am I distributing to each member in this group that I'm distributing to? Does it make sense? Or does it make more sense to give it just to the one person? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. The Imam, he says, Bab ikhraju zakah. The chapter now, when he's going to talk about issues pertaining to actually giving out the zakah. Who does it go to? How is it given? And issues pertaining to that. All we've spoken about so far is... Who is zakat obligatory upon? Which types of wealth it's obligatory upon? What is the rate of wealth and what is determined on how much you should be giving? Now he's going to talk about ikhraj zakat, giving the wealth out and how it should be done. So the Imam says, لا يجوز تأخير الزكاة عن وقت وجوبها It's not allowed for you to delay the zakat, the money, zakat, uh, from the day it becomes obligatory upon you. So once the hawl has been completed, then it becomes obligatory upon you to give that money out or to give that wealth out and not to have that delayed in any shape or form. Either amkana ikhrajuha. The Imam he gives, uh, we could say, a rule. He said, if it's possible, either amkana ikhrajuha. If you are able to distribute the zakah, able to give out the zakah. So, Shaykh Huthaymin, in his explanation of Zad al Mustaqni, Sharh al Mumta, he says, for example, you may find somebody has the money that he wants to pay for zakah. But he's living in a very dangerous place where a lot of robberies are taking place. So if he now goes out and distributes the zakah, people are going to know that this person has wealth. So they will come and they will rob him or rob his house. So he said, if there's a situation truly existed like that, then you can delay giving your zakah until that danger has passed. 
He said, maybe it's a situation, the seasonal differences. Everybody, Ramadan, is giving the zakat in Ramadan, which is a good thing, right? But there may be winter is about to come, right? A few months after Ramadan. And if you delayed your zakat to that time, it would be more beneficial and more appropriate for the poor to receive it at that time. He said that's also a situation that can be considered for you to delay it, okay? Another situation where it may be delayed if the person just doesn't have the money, the, the liquid cash at the moment, right? He has the, the, um, the trade stock, like we mentioned in Zakat al arud So he has the value above and beyond the Nisab, and it's been a whole year, but he doesn't have the liquid cash at the moment. So this person can delay until he gets the liquid cash for him to pay the Zakat. So these are like situations where he has an exemption for delay, right? And others. فَإِنْ فَعَلَى فَتَلِفَ الْمَالِ لَمْ تَسْقُطْ عَنْهُ زكاة. So if this person does delay, now we're talking here delaying without, um, without provision, without being allowed to do so by the Sharia excuses, right? Person who chooses to delay and he's not really allowed to do so. So if he delays the wealth from being given out and then the wealth becomes spoilt, right? His obligation is not removed. So he has the livestock, he has the trade goods, he has cash, but he didn't give any of that in zakat, right? On the day it was supposed to be due. He delayed it without cause. So then his trade stock is burnt in the fire. His money is stolen or something of that nature. The livestock dies due to some bad, poor weather conditions or disease. It's, the obligation has not been removed from him because he had tafrit. Tafrit meaning he was careless, he was lazy, he didn't uh, race to fulfill the obligation that was upon him. He had no excuse for delaying. So the imam says, if his money, if his uh, wealth goes wasted, becomes wasted, then this person is no excuse. But if, it, if the wealth is destroyed before the time of zakah becomes obligatory, then there's no zakah upon him. Why? No nisab ahsan. Because there's no nisab. Your wealth has gone for whatever, whatever reason, and then there's no nisab, and the person doesn't have to pay zakah. And it's permissible for you to give the zakah in advance, up to two years, okay, is the max in advance for up to two years, if you have reached the level of nisab. Once your money has reached the level of nisab, okay, though uh, you can give now zakah in advance for the, a year in advance or another two years in advance, okay, if your money had reached the nisab. There could be reasons for that. Maybe there's, a, there's um, you know, Mujahideen are defending the land and they need uh, extra weaponry, they need extra uh, materials in order to do that so they can receive money uh, for that purpose and Allah knows best. This is the opinion of the Jumhur, right? The majority of the ulama that you can give in advance for up to two years. A ta'leel, what does ta'leel mean? A reasoning, right? A ta'leel for why they have this opinion. They said that, look, the hawl, the hawl, the nisab, the hawl of the year for you to have money with you for a whole year before you give zakah, right? Now, if you make ta'jil a zakah, you're not going to have a haul for the two years in advance, are you? Or the extra year in advance. They're saying the haul is for the benefit of the person who owns the money, the one who's going to give zakah. Because in that haul, you can invest your money and allow it to grow. Now, if you, if you wish to drop that benefit from yourself, then it's up to you. You're allowed to do so. So that's what they're saying. It's your choice whether to have the hawl or not to have the hawl. So you can give it in advance. This is one of their ta'leeds. And in Abi Dawood in Tirmidhi, uh, Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib, he asked the Prophet Sallallahu if he could give him his uh, zakat in advance. And the Prophet Sallallahu allowed him to do it for up to two years. Sheikh Sa'ad uh, al-Khathlan, in his explanation of Umdat al-Fiqh, he says one thing you have to bear in mind, another scenario of ta'jil, giving in advance, is that when most of us, we calculate our zakat in this manner. We look at what we have in terms of assets, in terms of uh, cash flow, liquid cash. If we have a nisab at the beginning of the year and we remained having a nisab at the end of the year, no matter what we have at the end of the year in terms of va uh, value, we pay the account on that. We don't actually calculate month by month by month, right? So most of the months, in fact, 11 months of the cash flow in the year, the whole hasn't been completed of them, right? The year hasn't been completed. So he said, do not forget to make the niyyah of ta'jil on this wealth. So when you're giving the zakah in the manner that I mentioned, that you look at the beginning of the year, there was a nisab. You look at the end of the year, nisab and anything above, you give the zakah upon it. This is how most of us do it. He said, you also should have the niyyah of ta'jil. 
because you are giving, in fact, zakat in advance. Because all those months that a year didn't go uh, on them, you're giving zakat on them. I hope that's clear, inshallah. So the Imam says, Wala yajuzu qabla dhalik. You cannot make ta'jil of zakat until you have reached the nisab. Okay, before the nisab has been reached. وَإِنْ عَجْلَهَا إِلَىٰ غَيْرِ مُسْتَحَقِّهَا لَمْ تُجْزِئْهُ وَإِنْ صَارَ إِنْدَ الْوَجُوبِ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا If in this scenario of giving ta'jil, zakat ta'jil, zakat in advance, you ended up giving it to somebody who didn't deserve it, right? You ended up giving it to somebody who didn't deserve it. So for example, you saw somebody, you thought he was a person who was able to receive zakat. Then you came to know that actually he wasn't from the people who were deserving zakat then this zakat that you gave is not valid. Even if on the day for when you should have actually given zakat, because you're paying it in advance, even in that day when you should have actually given zakat, he becomes from the people who were supposed to receive zakat. Meaning a rich person then became poor. So you've given your, you've given your money in advance, zakat, like we said the imam allowed us to do up to two years. You've given it to somebody thinking he's a poor person. But in fact, it ended up being that he was a rich person. So your zakah here is not valid. You have to give it again. Okay, if you find out that this person was in fact rich. Even if this person later on becomes poor, right? For your next hole, for your next, when you should have given the, the uh, zakah which you gave in advance. So the next year or the year after, when you've, you realize that he became poor, even in this situation, zakah is not valid. Why? Because at the time of giving the zakah, he wasn't from the recipients of the zakah. So basically, in a nutshell, we have to be very careful who we give the zakat to. You have to look them up and down. You have to check as much as you can and ensure that you give it to the right people. So if you give it to somebody and the person was actually a recipient of the zakat from the categories, but then the person dies or the person becomes rich, or the person leaves the fold of Islam, none of this affects your zakah. Your zakah was correct. Why? Because you give it in the correct manner, on the correct day, to the correct people. So what happens after that to those people, it's got nothing to do with you, okay? Your zakah is well and good in this situation. You've given zakah, right, in the correct manner. But now your wealth has gone, something happened. You are not now allowed to go to the people that you gave zakah to and take your wealth back. From the moment you gave it as zakah and they received it, it's their mulk. Okay? هم يملكون المال They are in uh, possessing, possessor, possessor, possessors, possessors of the wealth, not you. They possess the wealth, not you, after you've given the zakah. Okay? So you're not allowed to take it back if it comes to a situation that you have a need, that you need to take or that you need to have some money. The Imam says, You're not allowed to give zakah to a country or a place where the salah, where the prayer can be um, shortened. What does this mean? What is he talking about here? You cannot give the zakah to a land where the prayer can be shortened. What does he mean? Huh? He's talking about distance now, right? So what did we say in the, uh, in the shortening of the prayer? Around 80 kilometers is what we said, right? Any distance of 80 kilometers, a land which is beyond 80 kilometers from where you are, according to the Imam and the majority, you cannot give your zakah to those people. Okay, beyond that border. Okay, of 80 kilometers and beyond. You have to give it within the distance by which if you were to pass it, you can join the salah, you can join the salah or shorten the salah. That's where you cannot give the zakah according to the majority, right? Unless you do not find anybody in your locality that needs the wealth, then you can go beyond this area that I defined. What's the proof of that? The proof of that is the hadith of Mu'ad where the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, teach them that there is um, an obligation on their wealth. It's taken from their poor. It's taken from their rich and given to their poor. So this pronoun, their, the ulama, they say it refers to the people of Yemen because that's where Mu'ad was when the Prophet ﷺ instructed him with this instruction. After you've taught them about the wealth, the zakah, take from their rich and return وَتُرَدْ ala فُقَرَائِهِمْ Give back him, give back to them uh, the wealth the, to the poor. So the ulama, when they discuss this, they say this pronoun is referring to the people of the vicinity itself. Okay, others who allow it to go beyond 
the land that I mentioned, the, uh, the, the distance of 80 kilometers, they say, no, this pronoun, them, and their refers to the Muslims in general. So whenever there's a need, a pressing need, beyond your land, you're allowed to give it according to that opinion, but that's not the majority opinion, right? So Imam, he said, not to give in, in, in a land which is beyond or in a land which is so far that if you travel to that land after 80 kilometers, you're allowed to join your salah or shorten your salah. Do not give uh, to that situation. Uthaymin, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, but if you have family relatives that are in need, then they take press, uh, precedence because they have the quraba, they have the relationship as well. So that's uh, also an interesting opinion. Tayyib, question, what if the wealth, what if the wealth you are going to give zakah is in another country? right and you are in another country so here you are in qatar your wealth is all in the uk where do you give your zakah they say a zakah that the zakah is connected to the wealth so wherever your wealth is that's where you give the zakah okay let's say now for example again you're in qatar your wealth is in the uk where do you give your zakah to fitr huh no this is different this is the opposite because here Zakah, Zakat al Fitr, Muta'allaqatun bil Badan. It's connected to the body, okay, to the actions that your body did. So here you give where you are. The Zakat al Fitr is distributed where you are. But the Zakat al Mal is distributed where the wealth is, okay? And you're confused. <laughs> if your wealth is in three different countries, Allah, I don't know, I've never come across it. So I'm not going to answer unless I've come across the situation. Zakallah khair. The Imam says, Bab man zaka ilayhi. The chapter wherein he's talking about who you can give the zakah to. Do we just make it up? Oh, I like this person. You know, he's nice to me. He's in need. I'll give him zakah. No, it's not like this. The Sharia has defined for us who zakah is given to. Okay? In Surah Tawbah, verse 60, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines the eight categories of who the zakah is given to. Inna sadaqatu. Uh, etc etc okay so Allah, the imam is going to take this uh, verse verse 60 and he's going to break it down in surah tawbah bit by bit so the imam he says they are they are uh, eight categories al the first of them is the fuqara the fuqara are those who are known as poor. But also he's going to mention another category, the masakin. So fuqara and masakin generally in the Quran, they come together, okay? So the ulama, they say, إِذَا افْتَرَقَتْ اجْتَمَعَتْ فِي الْمَعْنَى وَإِذَا اجْتَمَعَتْ افْتَرَقَتْ فِي الْمَعْنَى Like iman, like islam and ihsan. These two words, islam and ihsan, they mean two separate things, right? But if you, if you put them together, they come together in the hadith or in the Quran, then Islam means one thing, Ihsan, Iman means another thing. Likewise here, the fuqara and the masakin, a group of ulama said they, they, sh they are very close in meaning, if not share the same meaning. Okay, so if they are together, they have separate meanings. But if they are separate, mentioned separately, they share the same meaning. But the majority of the ulama, they say no, there's a difference between them. The faqir, the fuqara, are of more need than the masakin. Okay? So here the Imam he says, the fuqara wahum alladina la yajiduna ma yaqa mawki'an min kifayatihim bi kasbin wa la ghayrihi. The fuqara are those who cannot find the fulfillment of their needs either through earning or through having the wealth. They neither have enough wealth nor they, do they have the ability to earn enough wealth. So to make it simple, the ulama they said those who cannot find 50% of their needs of their basic needs, okay? This is the easy way to remember it. The faqir is the one who cannot find 50% of his basic needs, either through earning or through having wealth. Tayyib, the Hanbali scholars, they say that the faqir and the miskin, you can give uh, up to a year of what they need. But if you give beyond a year, say for example, you want to give zakat to this person which would go last him for the next year also, they say this is not correct, why? Because zakat is something it comes every, it's renewed every year. So you shouldn't do that. 
because the meaning of the zakah is to give every year. But Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, Imam Shafi, they say, no, you can give to the extent that you make the person rich. Because they said, in their opinion, this is better. You're taking him out of the fold of remaining poor. You make him from those who are rich, you're giving him enough money that he can go and invest. So he becomes rich. And now he starts to earn money in a proper way, and he then can give zakah. This is their opinion. طيب. In any case, what did the Imam say? The Imam said, that this is the person that does not find enough to cover his needs. The second category, the masakin, remember we said there's a difference. The masakin, right? The miskin is different from the faqir in the sense that he finds above and beyond that. He finds above and beyond 50% of his needs. Okay, above and beyond 50% of his needs. Where's the proof in the Quran that we, Surah Al Kahf, I'll give you the Surah, where we can find that the miskin is better off than the faqir? Or the miskin is able to eat? Huh? Ahsant. Okay, the owner of the boats. Amma safina tu fakanat li masakina ya'maluna fil bahar. As for the boat, it belonged to the masakin. The word is used masakin. They used to work in the ocean or in the water, okay? okay? Doing whatever they were doing. So they were able to earn. So this is one of the proofs that the miskin is of a better status than the faqir. In any case, the faqir 50% or less, the, the miskin above 50%, but not enough to fulfill his fundamental basic needs, right? Sheikh Abdul Salam al-Shawair, in his uh, explanation of Umda al fiqh he mentions that the basic needs are five. What do you think they are? First of them, the most important, food and drink, right? Of, but remember, these needs are how would you phrase this? These needs have to equate the status of that person. Right? We have to be fair in Islam. We give to him, to his economic status. We're not humiliating him, giving him like food which is not acceptable to any human being, but we don't give him food which you would expect to give to somebody who's earning a good amount of money in the year. Right? So it's food which would normally be given to somebody of this poor person or this miskin's economic status. That is the bare minimum. If you give above and beyond that, that's well and good. So the first of them is food and drink. The second of them is hmm, shelter. What do we mean by shelter? Do we buy him a house? Do we buy him shelter? No, we give the rent that is required, again, uh, sufficient or um, comparable to what will be found for his economic status, right? You rent him a place that will be suitable for someone like him uh, to live in for a year, okay? So what, clothing also, okay? Uh, clothing also. Marriage. The person needs to get married. We give him zakah for marriage. How much do you give for marriage? For up to four wives. Yes, honestly, the ulama, they say up to four wives. <laughs> if, he, if he, he's poor, but he has the first one, it doesn't suffice him. It doesn't, you know, he can't keep his deen together with one. So if he needs up to four wives, then you can give up to four wives. Taib. And the fifth of them is life needs, which vary from time to time. Life needs, like, um, you know, from time and place, he could be in a place where the refrigeration is a norm. A refrigerator is the norm in, in, in houses. So he has to begin a refrigerator. Or it's the case that an AC must be provided in that particular country where he lives. Or it's the case that he needs an operation, so we would give him money for operation. So life needs, okay? So these are the five areas in general that the Sheikh he mentioned uh, cover the needs of a human being. The third category that Imam mentions from those who zakah is uh, are recipients of zakah, those who work for the government in collecting and distributing the zakah. Why I mention government, actually let me not get into that. Those who, um, those who collect the zakah and distribute the zakah. وَهُمْ أَسْوَآتُ عَلَيْهَا وَمَنْ يَحْتَاجُ إِلَيْهِ فِيهَا And they are the ones who go out collecting the zakah and distributing the zakah and anybody who is needed to help in doing so. Like lifting the stuff, putting it in the trucks and distributing it, whatever. Whoever is required to be employed for that nature of work, then they should be employed and they should be given money from a category, as a category of zakah. How much are they given? They're given what is acceptable for that type of work. What if the person... Even if they are rich, they're still given from the zakah. Okay, they're given a wage if they want to take it. If they want to refuse, it's up to them. But the category is there that they are given by the state um, from, the, from zakah to distribute and collect zakah. Uh, if they are poor, then they're given zakah twice. Zakah for the work and zakah for the fact that they are poor. Okay? 
the Imam he says after that Rabi' al Mu'allafat Qulubuhum. The fourth of them is Mu'allafat Qulub. Who has the book with them? What's the translation of that? The fourth one? What does he say? Okay, Zakallah khair. Those whose hearts may be reconciled. So what we mean here is those category of people we want to grab their hearts. We want to bring them close to Islam. We want to bring them on our side. Okay, and these are different categories. The Imam, he says, وَهُمْ أَسَادَةُ الْمُطَاعُونَ فِي أَشَائِرِهِمْ They are in general the tribal leaders in their tribes. Okay, Muslim tribal leaders or even non-Muslim tribal leaders as we will come to know. The tribal leaders in their tribes. Okay, so they can be Muslim, they can be non-Muslim. The Imam he gives further information. So if you go to a tribe and you give to the tribal leader because you find in him that maybe, you know, something you have a, um, from intuition that if I give this money a lot of wealth, he will become a Muslim. So you give to that person as much as you can or as much as needed to make him become a Muslim. Why? Because if he, the tribal leader, becomes Muslim, generally the rest of the tribe will also follow the tribal leader in his choice. You still find this today in places like Pakistan, in Africa, in, in poor places. People follow what the tribal leader does, okay? So this is one of the categories. Or if the person has enmity towards the Muslims. So for example, a non-Muslim tribal leader, a non-Muslim leader of the state, you're able to give him, you're, you're allowed to give from the zakah to this person, to keep away his evil from the Muslims. So you give him like a bribery type of gift. Bribery is not the right word, but you give him a gift of value, right? That would keep his harm away from the Muslims. Or you give to people like this. They may be Muslim, new Muslims, to strengthen their iman. It can be given to new Muslims to strengthen their iman. And this is something which should be done. Many times in the dawah, people are made or brought to Islam, once they become Muslims, they left. No, use the zakah, give them gifts, make them feel that they actually belong to the community of Islam. Oh, or you can, another situation, the Imam he mentioned, that if there's a group of people in the Muslim world that are refusing to pay the zakah, and there's not enough strength in the local military or the local security forces to go and forcibly get the zakah from them, you can pay zakah to these tribes or to these communities to get them to help you to go to that area and forcibly take zakah from those who are refusing to pay the zakah. Okay? So in a nutshell, it can be given to those who can be brought to Islam. You see something in them that either they can be brought to Islam or even if they don't want to become Muslim, you can use the zakah to keep their harm away. Okay? Or you can give it to somebody, an individual, who recently became Muslim, but you think his Islam may be a bit shaky, so you strengthen his Iman by giving him gifts of that nature. The Prophet ﷺ did this. Narrates, uh, narrated by Imam Ahmad, Anas radiallahu anhu narrates that one of the companions, he said, after becoming Muslim, when he became Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ gave him sheep to the extent which were between, which were filling a valley. He gave him that much of a flock of sheep. So this person, when he went back to his community, he said, oh my people, enter into Islam because Muhammad sallallahu gives like he doesn't fear poverty. So the Prophet sallallahu would do that. He would give to people whom he thought if he gave to them, they would come to Islam or their harm would be kept away from the Muslims. Al-Khamis, Al-Riqab. The fifth category is Al-Riqab, slavery. To free slaves, okay? To free slaves. Wahum al mukatibun the first category of the slaves is the mukatib. The mukatib I already mentioned is the one who agrees with his master to buy himself out. So this one can come to the people of zakah and say, I need zakah to complete what I've started. I've already paid 5,000, I have 5,000 more. Give me 5,000 from zakah so I can free myself. This person is given. Or the normal type of slavery where a person is enslaved, then this is also recommended if the master agrees that you should purchase this person's freedom uh, and free him from the horror of slavery. Also, many of the ulama, they added to this, those who are imprisoned unjustly, whether in, uh, those who are imprisoned unjustly in the non-Muslim lands, because their situation is worse than the situation of the slave, okay? That this person, zakah should also be spent upon them until they are freed. And if I remember correctly, I believe it was Imam Shafi, he said to the extent that even if the Bayt al-Mal becomes empty, to the extent that if the treasury becomes empty, spending money to release the Muslim prisoners, then it should be done. So subhanAllah, how Islam used to be and how Islam should be. 
May Allah return it to us. Ameen. Tayyib. Asadis al gharimun The sixth of this category are those who are in debt. Those who are in debt. Wahum al madinun li islah nufusihim fi mubah. They are those people who end up getting into debt in that which is mubah. They get into debt not being extravagant or not being involved in haram activities. Okay, they get into debt for that, uh, for whatever reason being, and now that they find they've found themselves in a situation of debt, they can ask from zakah and zakah will be given to them. Okay, zakah will be given to them. One point here, the creditor, the one who money is owed to from a person, if this brother owes me money, right, he's in debt. When it comes to my time for giving zakah, I cannot say, okay, my zakah equals to 10,000 riyals, so I'm going to let him off the debt which he owes me, 10,000 riyals, with the intention of that being my zakah. You see it? I can't do that, because that ends up benefiting me. Right? So this is why the ulama say that this zakah cannot be done like this. So he owes me 10,000 riyals. I have to pay 10,000 riyals in zakah. So I said, rather than, than me giving it elsewhere, let me let him off his debt by giving him the zakah. Okay? The ulama, they said that this is not allowed. The ta'lil, the reasoning I gave was probably wrong, but this is what the ulama, they said that it's not allowed. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah was one of the minority who said that it can be allowed because it's all the same thing at the end of the day. It's all about giving the zakah, giving the wealth, which the person in need requires. And the person in need, the person in debt, requires the wealth. So whether you give it to him or somebody else gives, gives it to him, it's of no difference according to Ibn Taymiyyah. Tayyib. The Imam, he says, the second category of those who are in debt, أو إصلاح بين طائفتين من المسلمين. Or somebody who wants to make peace between two categories or two groups of Muslims who have a dispute. And the only way that dispute can be solved is by giving each group of uh, people in that dispute money. Saying, look, I'm going to give you this amount of money with the condition that you agree to bury this dispute. This dispute is done. Each one of you gets a thousand pounds or a thousand riyals, ten thousand riyals, whatever it be. And the dispute is now buried. Now this person can also take from the zakah with the condition that he didn't pay the zakah, he didn't pay this money from his own pocket. Why do you think they said that? Because it's not a debt. Right? He has to have borrowed this money. This person who's making peace between these two groups of people, he has to have borrowed this money for it to be a debt for him to take from zakah for being in the category of debt. So he borrows money to bring peace between two groups of people, Okay, and then he can go to the zakah people and say, give me zakah because of this good that I did. I brought peace between these groups of people by ensuring that the problem is buried if they take money. Okay, that is allowed in a nutshell uh, in this category of the zakah from al gharimun Asabi' the seventh category. Fi sabilillah wa hum al ghazat al ladina la diwan lahum. Fi sabilillah in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are the mujahidun, they are those fighters. Uh, for the Islamic State, for the Islamic country, uh, who are not in the Diwan. They are not in the official uh, records as being fighters. They are not employed by the state to fight. They are given whatever they need as a salary until they return from the Jihad, however long that may be and however, however much they require. They're given what they need to go out and to defend Islam and the Muslim borders. Many of the ulama, I shouldn't say many of the ulama, quite a few of the contemporary ulama, they have said now that Fisa Bilillah includes anything like building masajid, uh, money for dawah, uh, these kind of projects which come under Fisa Bilillah according to this group of Muslims. In fact, it's the opinion of the Muslim World Council. Okay? But the majority of the ulama, Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, all of them said, no, Fisa Bilillah means for jihad. Except that the Hanbali scholars, they allowed also Umrah and Hajj to be considered as Fisa Bilillah because in one of the narrations in Abi Dawood, the Prophet Sallallahu said, in al-Hajj, Fisa Bilillah. That the Prophet Sallallahu said, Hajj is Fisa Bilillah. So that's the exception, right? So the majority of the ulama, they're saying no other category except for the categories that Allah has mentioned in Surah Tawbah, verse 60. Okay? So Fisa Bilillah in the path of Allah when it's used, it means to mean in the path of jihad. Okay? Now, outside of zakah, can fi sabilillah be used to mean other than jihad? This is a debate amongst the ulama, and each side has their proofs. But the safer opinion, 
and the correct opinion, inshallah, for zakah, that it's only fi sabilillah, only means for those who are in the path of Allah Azawajal, fighting and striving to defend Islam and to defend the lands of the Muslims. Al-Thamin, the last of them, Ibn Sabil. Ibn Sabil is the wayfarer. Wayfarer is somebody who's lost his way, lost his ability to return to where he wants to be to, wants to, wants to be. وَهُوَ الْمُسَافِرْ الْمُنْقَطِعُ بِهِ وَإِنْ كَانَ ذَا يَسَارْ فِي بَلَدِهِ So he is the person who's traveling and he's unable to return to his uh, place of residence because he's lost his money due to whatever reason, even if he's rich in his country, right? So he's given the amount of money that he requires to return in first class back to his country, not first class, right? That which would be considered as normal, which is economy class, but not on one of those Pegasus Airlines, which I've heard are horrific, <laughs> right? Allah <laughs> alim. But he's given what, what will return him safely and comfortably, the normal, the normal comfort to his country. But what about in our day and age? Should this person be given money? It's a consideration, right? What's different in our day and age? If I'm in a place and I can't get to where I need to get to because I've lost my money, I can make a phone call. By making a phone call, I get a bank transfer very quickly or something can be sorted that quickly. So maybe in our day and age, this issue needs to be discussed with a sheikh, with a alim, with a student of knowledge. Okay, because in our day and age, considerations are slightly different. Things can be resolved uh, within a few minutes in terms of money needs. So maybe this person doesn't need to be given from zakat. Maybe he can be given money to make a phone call, to be able to make a bank transfer from the money that he has in his home country. This is something which we'll ask a scholar, inshallah. طيب. These people are the people of zakah and is not allowed to give zakah to other than them. Because in the verse, what did Allah says? etc. He started with innama. Innama in Arabic grammar is what they call adatul hasr. Adatul hasr means it's a tool of grammar which restricts that which is coming after it in meaning. Okay, so in the masadaqa, right, so verily charity, zakah, is this, these categories. Nothing else can be included in it. Okay, that's what one of the proofs, in nama, has that meaning. That the zakah is restricted to these categories. And the zakah can be given to one category. So all of the zakah collected by a community can be given, in fact, to one category or in fact to even one person. Because in Ibn Khuzayma, he narrates that the Prophet Sallallahu said um, that the Prophet Sallallahu commanded Bani Zurayqin bidafi sadaqatihim ila Salama ibn Sakhr. That Salama ibn Sakhr radiallahu anhu, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam commanded his tribe, Bani uh, Zurayqin, to give all of their zakah to this one person. And the hadith is in Ibn Khuzayma, okay? The hadith is in Ibn Khuzayma. Imam Shafi and some of the Hanbali scholars, they said no. They said it has to be distributed over the eight categories. Why? Let's go back to the grammar now. Because in the verse, it said, إِنَّمَا الصَّدَقَاتُ لِي فُقَرَى وَالْمَسَكِينَ This li, okay, is lam tamlik. Lam tamlik means the lam of ownership. So the, these people have to own the wealth. And also the wa, between each category, al fuqara wa masakin this is wa at tashrik so you have lam tamlik that this lam of ownership so the zakah must be owned and then you have the wa of tashrik the wa of tashrik means a joining so each category is joined in this that they all joined in owning the wealth so there must be ta'mim ta'mim in the zakah meaning that the zakah should cover all of these categories so according to imam shafi and some of the hanbali scholars they said that Every category should receive a portion of the zakah according to the grammatical uh, points that I mentioned. But our Imam and others, they said the majority, they said you can give it to one person or one category based upon the hadith that we mentioned. Tayyib. Wa yudfa'u ila al-faqir. The Imam is going to talk about now. Just hold the question, inshallah. Wa yudfa'u ila al-faqir wal miskin ma tatimu bihi kifayatuhu. It's given to the faqir and the miskin the amount of zakah which will suffice them in their needs. طيب. That's how much zakah should be given to them, whatever that be. And to the worker who collects the zakah and distributes the zakah, that which is appropriate for the type of work that they are doing. And to those who we spoke about that we're trying to win their hearts, right? 
we give the zakat to them enough that would end up us bringing them to our side either becoming Muslim or defending the Muslims or keeping the harm away from the Muslims and to the people of debt whether they're the slaves or the people who are doing good joining between people or other people in debt then we can give to them that which will remove them from their debt as long as the debt was a permissible debt and not one of israf and foolishness and to the one who's fighting for that which he is required for his battle and to the one who is lost we give him enough so that he can get back to his country that he wants to be in his country of residence and not extra should be given even if they find for example we're giving somebody a ticket Ibn Sabil to return the wayfarer back to his residency but he finds that we gave him 5,000 Qatar riyals, but then he got a discount of 3,000 so he says to himself I'll keep the 2,000 extra no he can't do that anything he ended up getting a discount on he didn't need to use he has to return to the people who gave him the zakah okay because only he can use all of these categories they can only use from the zakah that which was needed that above and beyond their need they cannot use they have to give back five of these eight categories they do not take zakah but except based upon need they take the zakah based upon need who are they the faqir, the miskin, the ibn sabil, the slave, and the one in debt, right? And four of them, you can give them zakah even though they are rich. Who are they? The mujahid, al amil, the one who is working for the estate in terms of collecting the zakah, al muallaf, these. Uh, with the ones that we are trying to win over in terms of their hearts bringing them to Islam or etc etc those people even if they're rich we can still give them from the zakah right and then he says well Ghazi the Mujahid in the path of Allah even if he's rich we have to pay him uh, for that duty that he's doing well Gharim li Islah that al and for the one who is joining between two parties of Muslims okay causing them to bury their issues between them by giving them money by borrowing money to give to them. Even if he is super rich, he is given from the zakah. Taib, we'll stop here inshallah, rather than trying to rush through it and to complete the chapter. Next week, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, we will complete the chapter. We will take a comprehensive test on the chapter of zakah. Okay, so please be prepared for it. And the, uh, there will be a very simple test format but I will have the uh, liberty that if you're answering too many wrong questions I will throw something at you <laughs> if you have any questions that you need to ask or any clarifications on what we've taken then feel free khair. any mistakes were from myself in shaitan anything which was correct was from as a gift from Allah